On today's episode of Gathering the Kings. Cravings, food cravings, they're just right. an emotion. And if you can recognize them as emotion, you can maybe combat your cravings. You are listening to Gathering the Kings with Chaz Wolf, featuring fellow seven, eight, and even nine figure business owners who have real battle scars from business and life, but have prevailed as the king that they are designed to be. We welcome high performing entrepreneurs to the stage in order to reveal the real of the real on what it takes to build a successful business today. We dissect the good and bad decisions they've made along the way that give a true and accurate picture of the journey of success and how you too can get there. Through this dialogue, you will learn the value of growing your network and surrounding yourself with power players and kings like today's guest. Grab your pen and notebook because we're about to dive in. What's up, everybody? I'm Chaz Wolf coming to you, Gathering the Kings podcast, coming from you, the Pensacola, Florida airport today. I know this is not normally my my uh, studio setup here, but James Collier here on the King stage. James, thanks for being here today, brother, and thanks for being awesome and, and doing a podcast with me while I'm in an airport. Good to be here. Thanks for inviting me on, Chaz. Absolutely. Well, I want to jump right in here. You've got an incredible business and story. What kind of business do you have, James? So our business is Huel, which can be found on Huel.com. We make nutritionally complete foods. So it's focused on the convenience aspect, but being nutritionally strong. Yeah. All our products are plant-based, so they've got minimal impact on animals and the, and the environment. And my own background is so I'm co-founder of the business. The, the primary founder is Julian Hearn, and my I'm the nutritionist behind the products. Love it. Love it. You've got, uh, you've got two beautiful minds with totally different skill sets. Correct. Yeah. Julian comes from a marketing background. He is really the entrepreneur. I know a lot of what you want to talk about here is entrepreneurs. And I've had this debate before with other people, because I will say I'm not an entrepreneur, which we can go there if you want in a moment. Uh, uh, he, he is very much the entrepreneur. He's, he was already a successful man in business. And then he found me as a nutritionist because he thought I might be quite good at what I do. And it turns yeah, out maybe, maybe, just I'm not, maybe I'm not too bad. So, and we worked for a year, he was working a bit longer than that, but we worked for a year before we launched in June, 2015 with Huel on our initial product, which is the powdered formula that changed and morphed and improved since then, but it's still roughly the same as what we launched with back in 2015. I love it. I love the, the contrast and you're right. A lot of the conversations that we have here are extremely entrepreneurial, but I love that you're kind of, you know, elbowing your way into the entrepreneurial conversation. I think that you're going to give us a great perspective on not just business, but how your brain works as maybe somebody who doesn't necessarily put themselves in the, in the entrepreneurial category. Of course, you're still involved with the business. And so you're going to have a, just an incredible perspective. So I'm excited for that. It's going to be super unique. So the listeners should pay close, close attention. I can already tell you got a, you got a sharp mind. I want to know before we get started into the, like the details of it all for you, James Collier, what is the burning desire? Like, why do you do this? What's the bigger picture? Yeah, you're creating a cool, your cool products and you're helping people, but like underneath all that, what's really the burning desire for you? Don't, I know you sort of opened up Chaz a moment ago saying, be open and sort of speak. So I'll, I'll try to do that. And like you said, a lot of guys you have on here, it's quite uncomfortable for them to do that. And I don't wish to sound self-righteous, but I genuinely want to help the world. And that, and that's truthful. I, f I feel that I probably have some things, some ideas that I con could contribute to the world that could possibly help people. And that revolves obviously around nutrition because that's my skill set. I've been working in nutrition for 30 years and I've got a, you know, quite a range of experience in there, probably quite unique, but also more recently I've moved into the sustainable food space, such so nutrition and sustainability. And that's looking at everything ESG, which is environment, social governance side of it. It's not my area of expertise, but it's an area I'm involved in and yeah, there's a lot more I want to do than just cure, which we can come to maybe in a bit. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate the fact that you've got it connected to more than just this business, which actually you answered the question just great. Yes, it comes across maybe a little like, I want to help the world, like you said, maybe a little self-righteous or maybe a little bit, you know, fluffy. But I think all of that for entrepreneurs is actually really important. There's got to be a little bit of fluff. There's got to be a little bit of, you know, kumbaya in there sometimes. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that that's actually the beginning of taking our one vehicle and applying it to multiple areas of our life for you, maybe even other areas or maybe even other businesses, as you just hinted at. So I definitely want to go to that here in a second. What, what is for you inside of the business as the nutritionist? I love this perspective. What has it been a decision that you've made in the business, maybe on the product or maybe business-wise 
that you look back and you're like, when we did this, this propelled us towards success. We've done a lot of what we do is teamwork. And I think Julian Hearn, he, he's a marketing background and he comes up with some wacky ideas. So he's more the ideas man. But what I, what I think I've done from day one, pretty much with all the products we've launched is he's had the idea. And then he's contacted me, you know, called me up usually in the evening with this idea, with a long conversation about this idea he's had and can, you know, is it, can we do this? And I've thought about it and thought, yeah, let me sleep on it a bit and let me further it. So we've launched, he's come up with the ideas and I've sort of said, can we make them happen and, or not? And usually we can, there have been a couple of knots. And then there may be a reason that I've got more excited about the thing. And then it's turned out maybe commercially. We haven't because as entrepreneurs, as you know, entrepreneurs have to sometimes learn to say no yeah. and not get too carried away. Yeah. yeah. This is a very interesting dynamic. Obviously there's a lot of different ways to say it. You know, you know, he's more of the idea guy. You're the, you know, you're the executor, visionary integrator, like lots of different variations of people saying this, this dynamic that works super well. And I have these relationships in many of my businesses as well, where I show up, I've got this grandiose idea. They kind of look at me like I'm a bit crazy. We noodle on it a little bit and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And so my question for you inside of that though, is as more of the integrator type, the one who's going to take the idea, kind of mold it out, see if it's actually plausible. You're going to be the one that, that's potentially executing it. How do you desire for him to communicate best with you? Like when he shows up late night and he's got, you know, this crazy wacky idea, like you said, what can you give the other entrepreneurs listening that are like him what kind of direction or, or maybe focus can you give to them when they're talking to people maybe more like you on their teams? Nutritionists, I come from a science background. So I will always try to stick, you know, science is all about truth. Right. That is, you know, the definition I always give for science is science is the continual pursuit of the truth, but being happy knowing that you'll never find it. <laughs> and that's... But we have to get close to it. So we can't right. bullshit customers. Not that Julian ever wants to. He's absolutely really good with being honest, which has been part of your success. Yeah. By the way, is being honest. And a lot of people like that open book that we have from a nutritional perspective about certain directions the customer's going in as well. So it's right. more just keeping it grounded. And it's not just me and Julian. I, I should also emphasize that make, make the decisions. There's a lot of other people across the business. We're now un just under eight years old. We've got 240 people working for us with an office, you know, in three offices in the UK and one in New York, where we've got probably about 30 or so in hooligans. They're people that work, <laughs> work for Huel or, or are regular consumers of Huel. If you've had Huel yeah. before, and yeah. listeners have had Huel before, they're a hooligan as well. Welcome. Love that. And so we've got range of skill sets from people in marketing background, obviously the finance background, sure. customer experience, customer service is a big, big deal for us. You have to talk to your customers in a good way with the social media. Obviously we've got marketing, we've got my side of the business, which is sustainable nutrition, we've got the quality technical team, the new product developers, right. e-commerce and the people team and international team. So yeah. we've got quite a range of people and, and a lot of these people bring ideas to the table as well. So it's not yeah. just about us. Sure. Yeah. I understood. I love, I love what you said there about science being, you know, the, the continual pursuit of truth, but being happy knowing that you're not going to ever get it. Would you say for looking kind of from the outside in, because this is how I feel about entrepreneurialism is that it's the continual pursuit of achievement or the next level, but also being happy that you're probably never going to ever get to where you really truly want to be. But would you agree with that? But truly ambitious people. Yes. I always think it's important because you can be ambitious, but you can get carried away and look, you know, and, and be not, be not be truthful to yourself. So some social media yeah. influences have kind of imploded because they've been able to cope with it and they've, and they go out there with a lot of what they talk about is use the term again, bullshit, yep. a big problem in nutrition, not wanting to sidetrack this conversation. There's a lot of influencers that, that are talking, giving nutrition advice when they shouldn't be. And right. of course it implodes if you, if you're not grounded. So yes, yeah. be ambitious. You've got to be ambitious if you yeah. want to succeed. But I feel that trying to be true is more important. Yeah. It's, it, it really is an interesting, extremely important, I think, vein that every entrepreneur has to have. And so what you're saying, or what I'm hearing you say is you can be ambitious. And I think every entrepreneur is to a degree, it, even you, you're ambitious towards finding the truth. And so I think that these desires that we have of serving people or growing a business or being able to tell the truth or find the truth, 
<clears throat> what I hear underneath that you're saying is that you got to just be honest about either what you're actually doing inside of it, what you're saying that you're doing, how you're doing it. Is it truthful? Is there integrity? Yeah. Are you leading people down a, down a path that maybe you shouldn't be? Like, I think that all of those things matter is what you're saying. Would you like to add anything to kind of like cap that off before we move on? Yeah, ultimately, you know, we've got, I mean, we've had a lot of customers worldwide. We've sold over 300 million meals now in the wow. seven and three quarter years we've been going. If we hadn't have been true to our word, then people would, People would have found us out. Yep. You know, it always does. It's, it always does. And from day one, we, we chose to do that, not to bullshit like a lot of nutrition companies do, mm. but more than just not to bullshit, to be open and explain the background. Why have we made this choice to make sure that this nutrients at a certain level? Why have we chosen this? Sure. You have to have commercial considerations sure. because we could, someone could produce an objectively brilliant product that's going to improve people's health. It's going to help the environment, et cetera, et cetera. But if nobody can afford it, then you've right. failed in both those two goals. Yeah. Yeah. So you haven't done that. Right. So you have to look at all angles, which is including the supply chain, which we've had huge strains on over the last three years. Yep. And, and you've, you know, more recently as we've grown, we've, we've focused on the ESG side of, of it, you know, to keep our sustainability credentials high because people do value that and they should value that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, let's flip the coin here. James, tell me about something that you guys have done that wasn't a great decision and uh, we can learn from it and keep away from it. We launched a product a few years ago, which was a nutritionally complete granola. Okay. And, and the product was average and we, we dropped it a few, few years later because it wasn't selling that well. So it wasn't necessarily a bad decision. It brought people into the brand. Of course, we upset people when we did drop it because although wasn't brilliant. Some people did absolutely Some love it. Love it. Yeah. 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 We also more recently launched Cure Wear, which is sustainable clothing. And we put a lot of time and energy into it. And we, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we did it, but we perhaps shouldn't have focused as much energy into that because whilst you're doing something in business, you're not focusing on something else. Yeah. So it's probably, yeah, we should have perhaps done it, but not as, not such a big degree. Yeah. I think that that's a really good, I guess, picture, word picture that, that you gave to us of, of taking attention away from one and adding it to another, because yeah. we only have a certain amount of attention units. I think that a lot of business owners get caught with the shiny. And yeah. even though sometimes those shiny things work out and it's maybe not a disaster, we realize in hindsight, man, if I had just put all my effort here or here instead, yeah. it could have been better. What do you think inside of that decision, number one, made you strip the granola and then number two, made you strip the granola, even though knowing that some people were absolutely loving it. What was the kind of internal workings there of that decision? We had a different co-packer was producing it and they perhaps weren't brilliant. Well, as though perhaps about it, they weren't brilliant. <laughs> so it was adding pressure. It's adding, adds pressure to, pressure to the supply chain for something that's, yeah. you're putting as much energy into ordering certain ingredients just for one skew yeah. that you're not, that you're... You need to streamline things. Sometimes right. pulling back is, is the best thing to do. Yeah. I mean, it's the old 80, 20, right? But it's not you know, the other thing of what you've just said, Chaz, the hindsight bias is a wonderful thing, right? We, but they're not necessarily bad decisions. Right. Maybe you could say on hindsight, they weren't optimal decisions, but you learn from them and yeah. that makes you learn the other learnings from the business and other things come out. So it's all good. Yeah. There was an agitation that happened inside of your team that produced some sort of creativity that today you may not have, you know, produced or have, um, if you didn't have, you know, if you hadn't gone through that situation. So I think that uh, we can all agree that we're, they're learning opportunities. It is interesting though, to be able to look back and go, okay, here's what we did. <clears throat> but really the, I guess I, I said it there just briefly there before we went back and forth, but you applied 80, 20 said, okay, let, we're spending a lot of time here on this box and it's not really our main, our main thing. And so when you can, when you can measure effort versus output or input versus output, that's leverage. And it just wasn't that great of a leverage for you is what I'm hearing. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And um, whereas we're doing really well with all of our other products, for instance, in our hot and savory range, which are savory grain-based or pasta-based products that you mix with hot water and put in a microwave sure. and stir a leaf for five minutes and then nutritionally complete meals. They're doing really well. We the, we launched the grain ones first and the pasta ones came a bit later. If we, we could be spending our time of developing them more in the pasta range sooner because 
people are loving them. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when yeah. you have the winners, you got to press in. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So they've got a range of 10 in that, in that range now, a, a range of flavors from some spicy. We've got the, the bolognese, the, the Thai green curry, sweet and sour, tomato and herb. Yeah. Yeah. All kinds of, I mean, it's almost lunchtime here, so I'm, I'm kind of a little bit bothered that we're talking about this, but I, I think I'll, I think I'll be okay. <laughs> okay. So think decision-making process. We just talked a good and bad. You gave us some really good mindset around turning, you know, quote unquote failures into learning opportunities, but let's say a decision comes across your desk right now. Maybe it's a new product. Maybe it's pressing into whether this is a winner or not, or any other decision for that matter. Is there a certain process that you follow trying to hone in on making good decisions? Do you mean as a team or me individually? Yeah. One or the other or both. One or the other. Well, as, as a team, we've got, we've grown really quickly, much, yeah. much faster than most other companies have. And that's meant that we've had to sort of learn as we've gone on. Um, we're still improving our decision-making process as a team. Now we have for our products, nutrition product development, we have a, like a, a gate process where we have a gate zero concept. Okay. All the way up to gate six, which is like two or three months after launch, to see how things went. Sure. And, and, then, and then do we want to do any other EPD, which is existing product development to improve that? Can it, can it be improved anymore? Right. Could our supply chain look at the, the cost profit? Is it, is it where it should be? Right. Are we going to launch that product in other regions? For instance, we've recently launched one product in America that we've not launched in Europe. Okay. A bit envious of you guys. Tell, what um, is it? Tell us. It's a greens it product, you, you know, like the, the greens product with all the nutrients in it. Okay. Yeah. So we've got pure daily greens is now available. It's been available for about two months over there. We're now trying to explore whether we can launch it over here because there's supply chain issues again. Got it. Got it. And okay. we're trying something different as well. We tried to do an America first product. We've always been a bit UK centric. We, we launched in the US two years after the UK, for instance, and sure. You know, you're a lot bigger country, both quickly and population. Right. We still feel there's much more room to grow in America. People are starting to hear about, hear about Huel now in America or from all different states right. in, in a big way. And hopefully that'll, that'll take off even more. Yeah. Well, I, I can only imagine that the listeners are, are hearing now and, and checking out your website, talking about all these incredible flavors and daily greens that you're talking about right now. So we'll hope that we'll help in that process. But the, the, what I'm hearing you in, in, in that team development, I loved, I loved the stages of getting it to launch more specifically. I loved how you had a couple of stages afterwards, number one, to make sure, was this a good decision? So you're still trying to decide if it was a good decision, but at the same time too, you're iterating potentially. And I also loved how it ended like the iteration. Of course, we're always looking to get better and innovate process and innovate products. But would you agree that at some point? you have to stop. There's, it's like a, you know, there's a balance there and it's like a, there's no cost or there, the cost is too high to keep iterating the same product that's already winning. Maybe, but we're not there yet. We feel there's improvements could happen. Look, yeah, I come from nutrition science. Nutrition science is always changing. It's always updated. There's new research. You new things are being truth. found out. So it's up to, to my immediate team to, to stay on top of that and share the information. It's something I'm incredibly yeah. proud of at you all. And I will, I do bang on about this. We're a nutrition first company. We've got several nutritionists and, nutritionists and dietitians, fully qualified, formally registered within the company, working in our research to researching new, new ideas and working yeah. across the business to make sure we're doing the right thing, making the right decisions. There's okay. not many nutrition businesses our size that have got right. that level of quality. Yeah, I, I can appreciate that. And I think that Really, anybody who is is any sort of lane of caring what they're putting in their body appreciates the value and accuracy and, and straightforwardness when it comes to nutrition. I want to go to our speed round here, James. I want to talk about KPIs. And so for you, again, this might be, you know, in, in your angle of the business specifically, but what's the one thing that you would track if you could only pick one? I think it would be the, the meals sold, right? Well, as I mentioned, we, we recently passed the 300 million meals sold worldwide. It's interesting because... People are obviously buying the products and obviously enjoying our product. And right. I'm going to give you, I know you said only one, I'm going to give you two. Is the, uh, the, the repeat rate customers who come back. That's right. If they're ha happy customers and how, yeah. and how frequently and what's the time period. Yeah. With a consumable like that. I mean, if they weren't coming back, that would be a pretty telltale, wouldn't it? Yeah, exactly. 
What do you guys do inside of the business? Just real quick, since we've got a little extra time here, I want to pick your brain on this. Since you're so into the accuracy, specifically not giving the BS, I know it's on the on the nutrition side as well, but how do you do that so that people keep coming back? Like how did these two things, the, the customer lifetime value that you just mentioned, and then the truth that you guys not only seek, but then produce, how do those things come together for you to be able to retain? Okay. We've got a really good website, great team that run that. On the part of that website, we've got a guides and articles section where we've got loads of information of all varied, varied de degrees of, of quality. So some of the stuff in the early days was written by me. It's very science, quite into the depth of one ingredient. And not many people read those, but some do. Sure. And those who do pick holes in us, That's holes right. in it, and they hold us to account. And they question stuff. Now, I've got answers for these because quite often they haven't got the full perspective. But there yeah. have been times in the early days when they asked the questions and, you know, and I thought, you know what, they got a point. So we've got that. We have a forum. We've got a big social media following. People, again, ask questions. We listen to feedback. We've got a brilliant yeah. customer experience team that deal with the front line, so to speak. And sure. a lot of that isn't just, oh, I, my parcel's gone missing. A lot of that is also, oh, look, I'm into this sort of sports, that sort of sports, you know, which, you know, can you help me? Because your products aren't primarily for sports people, of course. They're for everybody, busy people who want to eat well and want to have a, a, a good diet. But sports people can absolutely make use of our products to help optimize yeah. their performance. And there's people with certain illnesses and, and diseases as well who are in the clinical setting. I come from a clinical background myself. I used to be a National Health Service dietitian in the UK for seven years, a long time ago. But <laughs> I've, I've got that it's experience. Yeah, I did seven years in the late nineties, early noughties in that. So we, you know, this sets us apart. We've got, look, change, just to change the direction slightly. I feel we've got a responsibility here. And I do like to jokingly continually quote Spider-Man here with great power comes great responsibility. That's right. Because we're now almost a household name in the UK and we're doing really well in Germany. Sweden and Poland and a few other European companies, uh, countries rather, and the US as well. Yeah. People look at you and they take you and they think these guys, they've got us. I don't want to, I don't, I've got anything to worry about. This is my meal and I know yeah. I'm getting good nutrition. Yeah. It's trust. And for 99% and for of people, that's, that's all they want. Then there's the other 1% who like to get into the nitty gritty. And I love yeah. these guys. And yes, they do call us out. And yes, they do cause me a hard time. But yeah. without them, then, then the other 99% wouldn't be assured that we're doing the, the right thing. And so right. I think it is real. We, we have to continually make good products. And I just mean, don't just mean in my opinion, I have to be objectively able yeah. to be able to back that up with proper science or justification, peer reviewed evidence. Yeah. And we did have our first peer reviewed paper published last year in Frontiers of Nutrition. It was in July, I think last year, where we looked at certain markers in people that were, had Huel hundred percent for a month and we saw their cholesterol improve, their weight improved. And that wasn't what we were looking for. We were just looking to demonstrate that Huel was fine. All the vitamins and minerals markers were going to be adequate. Right. Right. And you got so, so much can, more. <laughs> we can back ourselves up. Yeah. I love that. I love just how that was just so important to you and how all the things that probably the marketing team cared about wasn't even why you did it, but it just happened to flow that way, which I'm sure gave you immense power and leverage from that study. So congrats on that. What about a resource, you know, the man probably here about regarding resource, the, the scientific clinician here, but for business purposes, what have you used or what would you recommend as far as a book, podcast, any sort of other resource for someone listening today that wants to Grow their business. Yeah, I'm very much a science guy. So I read lots of, not just nutrition science, but I like uh, cognitive psychology. So anything that comes from that aspect is brilliant. So there's a couple I'm going to recommend if that's okay. One yeah, is probably most of your listeners will have heard of Atomic Habits by James Clear. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of self-help books, but there are some brilliant ones. That's one of them. Highly yeah, recommend that. Equals of Atomic Habits. I was already kind of doing this sort of thing. I call them micro goals where I'll get up early and see if I can read so many pages of a book before I start work, seeing how many times I can train every week, et cetera. And then another one I'll recommend is Waking Up by Sam Harris, who's the philosopher neuroscience, who takes a very secular view of meditation and self-awareness. And I was a few years ago, I read that as when it first came out and 
I now meditate regularly off the back of that and other work I've read since. I used to, being a science guy, I used to poo-poo that as sort of new age bullshit. How wrong was I to do that? You know, there is good science behind meditation and mindfulness, and yeah. it massively changed me as an individual, my perspective. I used to have depression clinically, and I can categorically say through that and numerous other things I've done to change my life, that my last episode yeah. in 2017 will be my last. I'm sure I will get blue days and have problems and feel pretty crap from time to time, but yeah. not where you really, every morning you're waking up with a dark cloud. And yeah, that's partly due to meditation, partly due, due to viewing life differently, gratitude and other, other things yeah. like that. So they're the two books, waking up and atomic habits. Yeah. All those, all those frou-frou things. Right. Which is funny because I, I put myself in the same category where it's like, you have kind of, you, you kind of need to prove it to me. And I want to know the truth and I want to be able to really dial it in. I want to see how the machine works. And, and I would second that. I think that I've, from the other end of it, I've taken, whether it's self-help or mindset development, you know, meditation and all these things. And I've, I took them quite literally and said, okay, let me just see what this does. And I've gotten the same results that you have, which is in all areas of life, just, you know, explosions. And, uh, and of course there's other work that has to go into those things. You can't just, you know, sit in a quiet room and, and then expect the world to change. But I think that there's a lot of effort that starts with that. Just, let me just see what this does, which I just loved what you just, you know, if, from your background and your just super high intelligent mind going, you know what, maybe, maybe I'm not hundred percent right here or, or how wrong was I? Like, I just think that that, that vulnerability speaks, it should be speaking to the listener just volumes right now. They should be going to picking up those two books immediately because you're, you couldn't be more right. You want to add anything to that before we move on? I want to say one more book. I'm going to be greedy and not just have one. I'm going to have three. I love it. Super Forecasting by Philip Tetlock and Dan Gardner. Not a self-help book. It's actually a book about <laughs> viewing things differently. It's some of your listeners will have heard of Bayesian re reasoning, like a yep. Bayes equation. And it's introduced, I'd heard of it before, but it introduced me to really looking at that. Whereas you make your decisions based on the best available evidence at one time. And sure. So you can use that through the, the statistical perspective of the actual equation, but you can't really do that in everyday life, but you right. can make those sort of decisions. Is something true or not? Is it likely to lead to a good outcome? You can right. weigh up the pros and cons based on the objective evidence, right. not be emotion led, which yeah. is the key to it. So yeah. a, a good Bayesian will notice that their own emotions, but not let them lead them in their decision making. Not dictate. They will make okay. a rational decision making. Exactly. You just did it actually a few minutes ago when you said, I'm sure that I'll have blue days. I'm sure that I'll be maybe a little bit down, but I already know that my last quote unquote episode from 2017 was my last. That was a decision, yeah. clear line in the sand, and then an understanding that yes, I'll feel things, mm -hmm. but those won't control me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's right. Good, good steel, man. Yeah. Hey, that's what I do. Yeah. Good. I'll just take your stuff and then repeat it to everybody. It's, it's yeah. fantastic. Okay. I want to know about what you think about intentionally networking or masterminding other entrepreneurs, other scientists, other nutritionists, like, is there value in getting around other like-minded individuals? From, I'm going to speak as a nutritionist here. Absolutely. Because science is all about learning from each other, telling each other we're wrong, especially, yeah. I mean, I don't work in academia. I'm, I, but I sure. research research, if that makes sense. Yeah. I research other people's research and then would like to challenge them. and any, a good academic will welcome that. Of course, right. they'll feel like someone's just punched them in the stomach if they've been working on this thing for three years. And then another scientist has found out that it's wrong, but you have right. to accept that. So that's all part of the networking and scientific community. As for networking and entrepreneurs, not for me, if it works with, with, for other people, that's great. I, w I sometimes feel that it can be a bit a bit fake. You go out there, you're thinking, okay, I might, I want to go to this event, say, because right. I might meet, meet some people that might be able to help me in the future, which is all very well. But you, if I go to, if I were to go to such an event, I would go unconditionally that I want to meet nice people that have, and have good conversations, no expectations beyond that. I want to enjoy myself because I do enjoy good conversation. Yeah. As you're I'm enjoying myself now. Exactly. Yeah. I think that you're hundred percent right. I think that 
actually you just gave a little bit of a key, a little bit of a secret, which there's so many. And, and I guess actually it's the difference between networking and mastermind. Networking is where I'm going to go to get something, right? I'm going to get leads. I'm going to get a relate. Like, there's something. And then for me, masterminds or just an opportunity to connect, build relationships, even a podcast like this, where I have no idea what James and I will do in the future, or if I'll use his products or not, or maybe there's some event that we're both at together in the future. Maybe we'll run an event together. I have no idea. <clears throat> but I showed up today, shaking my hand, expecting nothing of James other than that we're both going to share today. And I think what you just defined is the differentiator when, when you have entrepreneurs that, or scientists, or fill in the gap who want to just get together, kind of shake some ideas together and see what happens. No expectations. Usually pretty magical things happen. Would you agree in the science world at least? Yeah, but that's science. Science is not just one paper. It's the millions of papers that have been produced in the last 400 years. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're talking about business too. <laughs> yeah. 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 I love, I love the lanes that we're, we're just parallel. We're just running and it's true. It really is. What about, I got one, one, one question here before we uh, finalize with the, with my last one, but what do you think about the things outside of business? So of course, for you, mostly the business is your science and your research and nutrition. But what I'm talking about is this life work obsession. Not a big fan of the word balance. I, I think that in order to be successful in business or in nutrition or in my family or as a dad or whatever, that I've got to be obsessed. I got to be all in. So give us some thoughts or some, maybe some practicals of things that you've done along your journey to be all in, in more than just the nutrition. Yeah. I've been going to gyms for 35 years, started training young, which led to an obsession with bodybuilding and probably had a bit of body dysmorphia. I did, when I was at school, I was bullied. And so I, I was that stereotyped cliche of going to the gym because I didn't like it, left school, never been bullied since. It, I did. You know, competed in bodybuilding, ended up working in bodybuilding. So my, my career was, when I left uni after nutrition and dietetics, I worked for seven years in the NHS in the UK as a clinical dietitian. And I left that and worked in the bodybuilding and fitness world as a nutritionist and doing other things there as well for, until, until Huel really, until 2014, 2015, yeah. which included providing advice to other bodybuilders, strongmen, athletes, MMA. I also did work on the doors for a while. And that was actually more when I was in the health service point because the UK health service plays, pays pretty shit. So you had to supplement your income. It yeah. wasn't good for me mentally. Looking back, thought it was at the time. It's full of egos when you're working as a bouncer. So yeah, it's, and yeah, so the gym was definitely an obsession and I ended up doing, as I've just alluded to, it infiltrated my work life at all all aspects. Right. Well, more recently, I've, I mean, I've always enjoyed reading, but I've probably in the last five, six years got more obsessed with reading, i.e. I will try and read 30 to 40 books every year, usually science-based, rarely a novel, but occasionally, sure. usually something science or philosophy or something like that. Obviously a lot of nutrition. Yeah. And this gives me a, a way in to give a little plug to my own book that will be yeah, coming out. Hopefully the end of the year, early next year, a food and nutrition book called yeah. Thought for Food, play on words there, how yeah. people can, can make rational decisions about what to choose themselves to eat better when looking at multiple issues at the same time, primarily for your own health, but also I've looked at nutrition for mental health, sustain, sustainable nutrition, eating for the environment, right. ethical eating. I've spoken about animal welfare. I'm not a vegan myself. I discuss veganism in the book, but... I am, you know, we have evolved to eat meat. I just don't think we need to be eating as much as we should be. I certainly don't think we should be eating meat from factory farms. I think they're wrong on so many levels. The only one thing they do right is provide cheap food, but I would challenge its healthfulness and I certainly challenge its effects on the environment and morality. Yeah. Uh, and also look at eating together and Obviously, I discuss what can be done to address the fact that we've got 8 billion on people on the planet to feed, and we need products like you, but other innovations as well to try and address this. So back to your question, Chaz, well, it's, yeah, I found, I've always written articles, but I found I really, really enjoyed the writing process. Yeah. So, you know, the flow state that we get stuck into when we just we lose track of time 
that's definitely the case when I'm writing and I dip in and out of it in the evenings and at weekends. And I wrote the book two and a, took me over two years, but it's highly referenced as well, about 600 references. So wow. I've tried to put it with the full rigor that one as a yeah. science writer, one, right. one should. So there's a lot I do, but obviously I do enjoy chilling out with friends as well. The gym is as much social for me as it is lifting right. heavy things and putting them down again. And yeah, I do also quite watch quite a lot of box sets series on Netflix and prime. I still, still get time for that there as well, go. because that's my switch off. I rarely yeah. watch documentaries on TV. I think I've got a, a problem because I seem to be learning for the rest of my life that when I TV goes on, documentaries seem to be banned in my own head. Well, you know, I just want to watch some fiction. Yeah. It, you, it, it seems like maybe you're serious enough at work and, and you need a little, need a little something else, which, yeah. you know, I think that, that we can all relate to that. Yeah. Uh, okay. I got one last question here for you, James, and we'll get this thing wrapped up. If you had an opportunity to whisper in the younger James's ear, what would you say? Well, what a question. I didn't know this one was coming. What would I say? I would say, don't be led by your emotions where you don't have to be. Okay. I've spent most of my life being almost an emotional person compared to some, but certainly I, like, like anybody, like any normal person, my emotions led me. It wasn't always right. Made made some bad decisions, probably relationships, both friends and ex-girlfriends were probably didn't go so well because of that. But on sure. the other hand, then if I hadn't broken up with those ex-girlfriends, I wouldn't be with my lovely wife now. So. There's always bonuses, That's so, right. but also, you know, on the back of that is don't live life with regrets. We all make things and you might cringe at some things you did in the past. And I certainly do. We won't talk about them, but <laughs> they shouldn't regret them. Ultimately they're yeah. done now. And the feeling yeah. you'll get is just an, a feeling in your consciousness. It's just an emotion itself. And all an emotion relates to my own field as well. Cravings, food cravings. They're just right. an emotion. And if you can recognize them as emotion, you could maybe combat your cravings. Yeah, that's incredible. You waited until the very end to say it. No, <laughs> I appreciate There's that. Any lunch you. Well, I, no, I, in all seriousness, though, I think that the power of what you just said, uh, regardless of what time it is and what my tummy's saying, but I, I think that what you just gave us is the recipe of self-mastery, really, whether it's the understanding of of your schedule or understanding of what you're eating or why you're eating when you're eating or how you divide up your your uh, your interests or your obsession so you you've given more to the entrepreneurial community through this podcast than maybe you were even anticipating so i just appreciate you for that james how can we a find your product number one because i definitely need some number two how can we find you we want to pick your brain or we want to poke holes or we want to just talk to you as a business owner i know that you you're uh, you're keeping yourself away from the entrepreneurial group, but we, we, we embrace you. If we want to reach out and talk business, what can we do? If you want to reach out and talk nutrition to me, then I'm all ears and talk business as well, but it's not my area. That's my colleagues. But yeah, if any, I mean, a lot of your listenership will want to eat well and they want to, they're busy people right. and they want to eat convenient food and that's nutritious and know that we've got them. And then that's huel.com, H-U-E-L.com. We've got all our products there. We've got nutritionally complete meals. In some of the stores on the, in the New York area, and I believe we're going to be heading elsewhere and you can pick out a power ready to drink bottles, but they're available on the website as well. It's convenient, that's nutritious food. That's, uh, that's ideal. And if people want to reach out to me, LinkedIn is always a good place to start. I'm also on Instagram. I'm just decided as of last week to try and push my own social media following, basically to try and get book sales when it comes out. And also because I, as I alluded earlier, Chaz. There's a lot of misinformation on social media from influencers. That's and right. I feel the way to combat that is my responsibility as someone who's a formally qualified, hopefully credible nutritionist to do more of that myself. That's right. So yeah, on Instagram in, and then Huel.com. Love it. Love it. We'll put all of that in the show notes as well. I hope that the listeners jump on all of those opportunities to connect with you. James, you've been incredible. You have an incredible mind. Your business is booming. Thank you so much for being here and serving blessings on your team and all the things that you guys have your hand to and all the new cool products you guys are coming out with, I'm sure. And again, just thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Chas. Thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. 
what I have realized not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries and now interviewing literally over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight and nine figure business owners is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings literally exists to bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together 1000 Kings specifically who are grateful, but not done. We're intentionally assembling Kings who fight tooth and nail for their business, family and communities. And here's what we believe that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas, that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy. So if that relates and, and resonates with you, and you know that you need people around you, sharp, qualified, other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1,000 Kings. Talk soon.